What is going on? It's Alex going back at you with another video. And today we are going to be doing a three round at 2025 NFL mock draft with trades. It's going to be split up into two different days. Day one is just like in the real NFL draft round one, day two, rounds two and three. So that is going to be tomorrow. But if you are new, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, blow my face with my board. It's always changing with the reevaluations that I'm doing, but it's honest. It's transparent. It's different. It is what it is. Let's get on into this. Of course, use that link tree that is in the description below because you're two clicks away from doing anything you want that's related to the show, including my X page where I end up actually posting all 22 clips that support my conclusions, but also our sponsor of the show, Underdog Fantasy, where you get up to a thousand dollars in bonus cash when you sign up using that link. It sends me 60 bucks, but you know, they're a great company. I support them. They take care of you guys very well. They take care of me very well, and I love it. Let's get into this, though. Starting out with the number one pick with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think that's certainly possible to be able to trade back from this spot, but I mean, I just don't know how quarterback desperate certain teams are. I don't think the Raiders are necessarily based on the quantity of issues that need to be addressed. They aren't that level of desperation for a quarterback. So I don't really see this as a potential position that has enough value for the teams to pay the price that is required to move up to pick one now someone brought up the fact that travis hunter very well might end up being one of these surprise fall candidates and there is some reasoning for that he's not necessarily wide receiver one right you have guys like tetra mcmillan that people love even isaiah bond that people love and so travis hunter is not always just a guaranteed wide receiver one of the class but also for the cornerback position, he's not necessarily corner one either. So there's certainly like there's value to him being able to play both sides of the ball where I assume he'd play primarily receiver based on the amount of money that receivers get and then come in on certain passing downs as a corner. I don't know. It would be certainly interesting to see what his decision is, but I think that we all kind of lean towards the wide receiver route and you know, I will say if it's the Jaguars perfectly, they're trying to get rid of Christian Kirk by the trade deadline before he got hurt. And this is a perfect replacement for it. But if he falls, it's because just because you're a jack of all trades in college doesn't mean you're going to be that in the NFL. It really depends on what people believe Travis Hunter's translatability is to the next level. For the New York Giants at pick two, again, this is going to be an easy one for me. I would like to recommend Will Johnson at this point, but it's just unrealistic. This team is so desperate for an actual impactful quarterback that they're going to be willing to reach. And if you guys have not seen my over one hour quarterback video where I broke down the top quarterbacks of the class, which I mean, technically it was, I believe, 15, 14 of them. So, you know, it's certainly more than just the top guys, but I uh, ended up reading a scouting report for every single one of them that justify my decision. But Cam Ward um, is one of my top guys. I ended up mentioning in there, I do not have a single true starting grade on any of the quarterbacks in this class. That being said, um, you know, there's certain ways to mitigate that. If you're in the right system, I think that you can essentially move up a tier in terms of your role. If you're in your right system, you're going to perform better than when you're not, right? I think that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. And I think Cam Ward would do well here in New York. Depends if Dable's going to be there next year. That's the big asterisk. They're likable people, Joe Shane and Brian Dable. But at the same time, I think there is certainly some question marks that would kind of indicate which way um, the quarterback route would go for New York at two. But uh, they're one of those teams where, especially if you can get someone who could make Cam Ward in the best version of himself, you might end up having a lot of success there. At pick number three, we got the Tennessee Titans here. This is probably one of the first spots where I would like to potentially look at moving back. Wide receiver certainly is a key position to target here. And I'm looking at the Raiders, and I think that they're just a prime candidate to move up without, like I was talking about number one. I'm like, oof, that's really expensive. For this range, I know that we might end up saying that this particular move I'm about to make is a fleece of the Titans, but I'm not losing on any of the talent that I'm going to draft for Tennessee. Let's just be real here. I just certainly don't see that as the case. Um, so I personally feel pretty damn comfortable moving back here at this point. And um, I'm going to have the Raiders move up. Again, I've tried to adjust this as much as possible. It is inexcusable by PFF for the fact they don't have trades properly accounted for, including even all the way back to the Devontae Adams trade. I had to manually do that. I, I shit you not. Like there's trades even back to, um, I mean, the real big one is, um, what? why am I forgetting the dude's name? Jahan Dotson. Like that trade isn't in the simulator already so i have to go in and manually do it so if i slipped up on something please comment about it and luckily it's not going to affect this video necessarily 
I mean, it could because, you know, what if there's a pick there? But um, I thought I did pretty much every single trade that I thought would have a massive impact or at least a noticeable impact, i.e. I within the first five rounds. So let me know if there is something that you do see. However, obviously, there would be enough in here to be able to justify a minimum of a third round pick in order to move up and jump the uh, jump the Browns. I do think they'll end up requiring future draft capital as well. You guys can mess around whether it's a third or a second. In general principle, when I'm going to be doing the next round, that third rounder or second rounder probably is not going to be a big part of it. So it really won't actually make a big impact. But uh, regardless, the Raiders do need to make a move up here because I think the Browns are a key candidate for a quarterback. And, you know, maybe that does boost this to a future too. But again, you know, feel free to mess around with this as much as you like. That is going to be where I would feel comfortable. If I'm the Titans, I'm getting my third round pick back and I'm getting the exact same player. Remember this. Like, I know exactly what I'm doing for the Browns, and um, I don't really think any of the options would be sniped away from the Titans, uh, what the Browns and the Raiders would take. So you're basically getting free draft capital by doing that. So at number three overall, the Raiders have moved up, and they're going to select their QB and Shadur Sanders. There's the connection to Tom Brady there. There's just a lot of reasonings as to why you'd feel comfortable with that move. They are another one of those teams, the Giants as well as the Raiders, are those two teams that are like extremely desperate for a QB to where I think if you put both of those guys in the right situations, they would end up netting positive results. Again, do I think they're worth number two and number three picks respectively? No, but sometimes teams just desperately need it. And it's not like you're going to instantly need another quarterback. I don't have that type of uh, concern with those two specifically. Maybe a couple other quarterbacks, I would say, not as much confidence. But at pick number four for the Cleveland Browns, this is a candidate for a trade back here. You got Will Johnson on the board. And like, I personally feel like Will Johnson should be wanted more. You also have Abdul Carter on the board. I think he should be wanted more. Um, but I mean, I'm looking at the Patriots here. You could be a move a team to move up for a wide receiver or a um, offensive tackle. Just not good offensive tackles in this class, man. I'm going to be for real. Like, there's just not good offensive tackles by any stretch. Uh, but looking at the teams that are within striking range, there's just not really one unless you want the Cowboys to get ballsy and go all the way up to select either Mason Graham or Ashton Genty. I don't see it being a net positive mood for pretty much any franchise at this specific moment. So we're going to actually have the Cleveland Browns look at a couple options here. And it's going to ruffle some feathers. I get it. But I'm really going to be heavily leaning towards Ashton Genty here. And again, I know, sounds batshit crazy, right? Running back at four in this NFL. First off, NFL running back value has pretty much shot up based on their usage this year. However, I want to throw that aside. I always want to recommend for us to actually look at the NFL through a historical lens as well. And historically, has there been a talent similar to Ashton Genty? Technically, yes, it's Saquon Barkley. He went at number two. But let's even tone it down a little bit. Let's look at um B. John robinson he was at number eight overall pick but also in that class jameer gibbs was the the lions said they were comfortable taking jameer at number six overall and yes that's a final piece to a puzzle but the browns have had their success by running through kareem hunt and nick chubb that's where they had their dominance was a consistent run game that's not necessarily there anymore and when you have issues at the quarterback position and can't really get value to upgrade that position Grabbing a wide receiver is not going to help. Like, it will help a little bit, sure. Grabbing an offensive tackle would have been great if there were offensive tackles in this class. I don't trust Will Campbell to be an offensive tackle. He's going to be someone for a team that needs a guard, potentially. So you are kind of screwed in that aspect. So what's the biggest way to have a wins above replacement move here? If no team's trying to move up, it is being able to rely on that run game. Again, Ashton Genty, Boise State's offensive line is not elite by any stretch. This dude bounces off contact like it's nothing. And I know, again, it's batshit crazy, but we have to look at the NFL and we have to realize that that is a realistic move based on what the NFL evaluates these running backs value as. And for a team like the Browns that have historical presence of have or historical, at least recency bias of being able to live through the running back, win through the running back, it does seem like that could be the route that they see as a very wins above replacement move. And I think that's a smart move for a team that can certainly use the identity of a top tier running back system when you are losing Nick Chubb this year as well. At number five for the Tennessee Titans, I'm going to be going after Tetero McMillan here. It just makes a ton of sense. Uh, he's a top tier weapon that replaces a massive vacancy there that DeAndre Hopkins has now left. 
And yes, quarterback would be nice, but there's, again, not a quarterback there I trust. Right tackle would be nice, not a right tackle that I trust. At number six for the Patriots, you know my issues with the offensive line before? They're still applied right now. And, you know, wide receiver-wise, I'm hoping Javon Baker eventually takes that big step up in year two. Right now, he's been more of a special teamer. Malachi, or Malachi, I was about to say Malachi Corley. Um, Jalen Polk, he's been relatively unreliable. Um, you know, he got a two-yard touchdown this past week. Woo -woo. But I don't really think that he necessarily has been phenomenal, but also not a reason to just give up on him yet. Uh, Pop Douglas is great. And then you also have a couple other receivers that are in the mix on top. So, I mean, I think there's certainly some room for improvement at wide receiver position, but I don't think the value is here. So evaluating other positions, uh, you could end up saying that the interior of the offensive line needs work as well. I think time might be honestly the best aspect that are the best uh, re return on investment is like just letting Layden Robinson develop, uh, potentially kicking Caden Wallace into guard where I ended up falling in love with him as a potential guard prospect. Like there's certainly that route that I think would be very smart. I think the best way to have a good return on investment here is either by a trade out or by going best player available. Will Johnson is the best player in the class and pairing him up with, uh, I mean, pairing him up with Gonzo would just be absolutely batshit crazy. This team has an identity on the defense and yes, you should do everything you can to help out Drake May in the offense. But when something like this falls into your lap, who's pretty much slipped solely because of his injuries. I don't think you can pass up on it. And I already know that several other teams would probably be salivating at the opportunity to go after Will Johnson. We are not going to let that slip. And number seven for the New Orleans Saints, I think that Mason Graham's an easy target here. However, I do think this is a team that could be certainly open to offensive line. You look at Will Campbell here, I think that's a great pick. I think you could even go and look at guys like Kelvin Banks. And because of all that flexibility, I mean, yes, Mason Graham is an excellent pick here. But I do think the Dallas Cowboys should at least be questioning a move up here. And to be fair, it's a very expensive move up uh, because you're going to be jumping the Jets. You're getting a player that the Saints would probably want and also the Dolphins. So I think there's going to be some mutual interest around that range for uh, a lot of the talent. But I certainly think that it could be in New Orleans' best interest to move back. But to be fair, when you get an option like Mason Graham at pick seven and you can kind of give a middle finger to three of the next four picks, kind of feels good, doesn't it? Feels a little bit good. I will say this, though. I'm actually going to throw a curveball here. I think that the next pick in your own division is going to be an edge rusher. The Saints still need edge. Their edge investments have been pretty garbo. So we are going to take the first edge off the board. And... Um, you know, as James Pierce, Abdul Carter, those are the top two edges for me. I'm going to be going after Abdul Carter because I'd be most scared of Abdul over James. Even though I have James higher, I think Abdul has just an even higher ceiling that James still easily can reach, but you're essentially selecting which one of the two you want to go at pick number nine. But at pick number eight, we have the New York Jets. And if Mason Graham's here, you take Mason Graham, you do it. So I don't think that there's going to be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Let's just take them and call it a day. At pick number nine for the Carolina Panthers, I am going to be going after said edge route, and I'm going to be going after James Pierce Jr. This guy's been fantastic. He started out the year slow and has just built up all year long, and I thought he's been doing such a fantastic job. Very underrated for his speed to power. At 242 pounds, you don't think of it too much, but I honestly think this guy is a mini Dallas Turner, so James Pierce is going to be the selection. At pick number 10 for the Miami Dolphins, this is an easy one for me. Will Campbell's here, and I know that grabbing guard at 10 is not necessarily the greatest move, but he also can fill in at tackle. I don't think that it's going to be a lost cause of him being a future left tackle, but I like the fact that you have a role for him as a guard if he needs to be that way. And at pick 10, it's not the worst investment on planet Earth. Don't get me wrong. I think Will Campbell would be a very good one there for the Dolphins. At pick number 11 for the Dallas Cowboys, I would have loved Ashton Genty. Ended up taking him earlier on. If you guys are wondering, like you're like, holy shit, you took him? Um, feel free to go back and listen to that. I think defensive interior is key. I think wide receiver is key. Um, you know, unfortunately, I do think that well, I think this is a key position to potentially trade back because you have Kelvin Banks, you got Nick Scorton on the board, and I can see those guys being part of this next chunk of players. And I also do think that 
Uh, the left tackle situation, you got Kelvin Banks. And by the way, I'm going to take this on the chin. I thought Cam Williams, because I saw him get injured. I did not see him come back into the game. I thought he was out for the year. So I ended up spreading some misinformation about Cam Williams in the last mock draft I did. I take full responsibility for that. It's just I was watching the game with you guys, and it was like, oh, my God. Like, this broke my heart. And then I just didn't realize he came back in. So I'll take that on the chin there. But uh, even so, I still think Cam Williams should return. We're going to probably designate him for return. We'll we'll debate that, though. Uh, but Kelvin Banks, Arianti Urzuri, Josh Simmons. Those are the next three tackles. And I know that for a fact, I'm going to want one right here for the Seahawks. I want one for the Rams. I want one for the Bears. And I want one for the 49ers. I think for the Dallas Cowboys, especially since you just gave a fourth round pick, God forbid, for um, a wide receiver that's unproven, I think the best thing you can do is be able to trade with one of these guys. And I do know the Bears get aggressive, and I think the Bears are the ones that need left tackle the most. I mean, I saw Pryor, and it's like, whew, Karan Amagaji could still have a future there, absolutely former third-round pick. But I think that the Bears really do. I'm going to double-check their draft capital situation. Based on what they have, I think this is a perfect opportunity for a recomp of picks to where the Dallas Cowboys could actually be in a really good situation here um, because they're going to essentially get an extra third round pick by doing this. So from pick number 17 to 15, it was 120. Technically speaking, I should go 49 and go 75. I think that actually would be a lot more reasonable. The fact that the Cowboys can get that second, second round pick in there. I think that's actually a little bit better because I think that pure 81, that's not enough value. And you could technically try to poach another pick in here. I just don't think that it would make a ton of sense for either franchise to do that. Both of them don't have their fourth round pick. Um, you could end up trying to argue about San Francisco. Like, we'll check out San Francisco for a sec. Like, they have a solid quantity of picks. This one would end up probably being like 1850 and like maybe 101 for um, 1175. And then you could toss in another pick. That starts getting so, so weird. Like it, it starts getting a little bit finicky at that point to where um, I think there's just a little bit more incentive from the Chicago side. Get that second round pick. Let's not worry about it too much. Like I know that it could be more uh, beneficial to trade with the Niners, but I mean, if you really are that butthurt about it, feel free to toss in a future draft capital pick. I personally would be fine with this. That's me. That's the way I view things. Like you could toss in 152 and give up like 185. Like you could call that, oh, hello. You can call that a cool move up, but sure. How about that? We give Dallas a little bit more um, reasoning to move back and the Bears move up to select their left tackle of the future. That's going to be Kelvin Banks. Worst case scenario, he ends up being a guard because he's 6'4", but I don't think he's ever, he's never given me a reason to really truly, outside of the six foot four number, believe that he's a guard. I think he's a pure tackle at the next level, uh, but he's a damn good player. At number 12, we have the Indianapolis Colts. And for the Colts, uh, I think edge rusher is a key position for them to address edge two. I know that they already just went edge one, but having a defense, like being able to have two top edge rushers, especially based on this class, could end up, it could end up yielding a ton of positive results. Uh, Corner-wise, Ben Morrison's not going to be coming out in this. Again, I forget to say that at the start of every video. I think this is a key team to be able to draft someone like Azariah Thomas, a bigger corner. But you know what? I'm going to roll the dice right here. We're actually going to go after Nick Scorton, edge rusher out of Texas A&M. We're going to go back-to-back -back first rounds with top-tier edge rushers. Uh, Nick Scorton's a fantastic player. He should have been a top-five pick, but he's ended up having a little bit of an up-and-down year there at Texas A&M. Right now, it's back on the up, which is a beautiful thing. At pick number 13 for the Cincinnati Bengals, I know that their safety core has not been very impressive, even though Geno Stone signed that three-year contract. I am personally going to elect Malachi Starks to be a new beast, a new, I, I honestly, him and Xavier Watts, I would not rule it out going back-to-back -back safeties at some point in this draft. But ever since Jesse Bates has left, there's not really a fear of the secondary. Malachi Starks could bring that back. At number 14 for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you could look at wide receiver here. Wouldn't blame you for doing it. However, I'm going to be going after the pretty obvious option, which is one of my favorite players in the draft. That is Jalen Walker, edge rusher slash linebacker out of Georgia. He's going to play primarily edge rusher for this team, though, even though I think that he'd be nearly a blue chip player at both positions. Number 15 for the Seahawks. We are going to be addressing that offensive tackle position. 
And you got Arianti Ursary here. You got Josh Simmons here. I think Ursary's run blocking and just overall athleticism really does fit the Seattle Seahawks mold to a T. Again, we're actually going to have Cam Williams return in this one. I think it's fair. I'll end up putting that in the description. We'll have Williams. We'll have Morrison return as well as, of course, Harold Perkins. Um, so we're going to go Arianti Ursary. Uh, leaving the Rams, they're at pick 16 to give a massive middle finger to the 49ers as they draft the next offensive tackle in Josh Simmons. He is the best tackle in the draft. He just had a season-ending injury, which drops his value just a little bit. Pick number 17 for the Dallas Cowboys. I think this is a prime opportunity to potentially address that wide receiver position because, yes, you spent a fourth-round pick on someone who I don't think is going to be a big impact. The running back class, there's nobody that I think would be worth it here. Defensive interior-wise, actually, I would feel pretty comfortable going after a player who I really love in Walter Nolan. He's technically dropped in terms of efficiency as of recent, but he's just had such a phenomenal year that I don't really think that we could blame him for it. He's become more and more in the spotlight, getting those double teams and like, um, actually don't quote me on the double teams thing. I'm forgetting about the double team percentage for Walter Nolan, but regardless, he's had a fantastic year. You could toss him in the mix there with like guys like Dayon Walker, Kenneth Grant as well. I love Kenny G, but at the same time, I know that you guys are petrified of Michigan defensive interior talent. So Walter Nolan will be the pick for me. You ended up acquiring extra draft capital because of it. And I think it's key. I think you need to get a couple of big stars and Walter Nolan will be the first part of it. Pick number 18 for the San Francisco 49ers. Again, Cam Williams is returning in this one. I made that selection or that um, not selection, but I made that choice uh, a couple minutes ago. So it's not on you for not knowing it, but I'm going to do something pretty cool here. And I know for a fact that I'm going to want this guy to go in the first round. So I'm going to make it happen. And you have two corners, technically three, up for a contract, but two key corners, uh, both in Lenore and Ward, I believe. So you need to go after some cornerback help. Renardo Green's done a fantastic job. But you know what make Renardo Green feel right at home? Give him a former teammate there in Azariah Thomas, my number 12 player in the class. Of course, he's not listed here on PFF, but... You know, it is what it is. Uh, we'll use Central Cypress as the placeholder. My number 12 player in the class, Azariah Thomas, the cornerback out of Florida State. At number 19, we've got the Denver Broncos here. I think left tackle technically would be smart for them. Once again, we kind of depleted it. But Josh Connerly is here, and I actually really like him as a pure left tackle. He could end up kicking into guard uh, because he is 6'4", has some anchor issues, but he is very familiar with Bo Nix. So I do think that I might want to roll the dice on him. And I'm looking and looking and looking, and I can just see the Packers, like this is their time. This is their draft. Like the draft's gonna be in Green Bay. Let's have a big move up. Why not? I think Green Bay would be smart to move up for Kenneth Grant. I think it would be very, very smart. So Green Bay in a prime opportunity as well. I think this would be about just pick 125, which I think is great for the Broncos. Adds an extra pick. I know that we're a little bit light on them right now. And that just allows us to be able to make a little bit of a move back and make a smart selection without making a very forced decision. And we jump the Houston Texans here to select Kenny G. At number 20 for the Houston Texans. Kind of took the one guy I really wanted, but... I think that's perfectly fine. I do believe that we could end up moving back in this situation. Again, Ben Morrison's going to be returning in this. Same thing with Cam Williams. I think guards the route that I want to go the most. Of course, at 52, I know that that is going to be a position I could address. Um, looking at the defensive interiors, you got Dion Walker here. You got Tyleek. You got Derek Harmon. I will say I do like those options for a lot of these teams. So I do kind of worry about the potential chance of them being sniped. Uh, so I think I might have to pull the trigger on Dion Walker here. Cause he has done so much better as the season went on. I mean, like he was down like the three percentile for a lot of this and he's just done a great job at rebounding. And to me, that's something that I believe that this defensive organization would be really a big fan of. So we'll, we'll roll the dice on Dion Walker. He's just a freakish build. And you, I know you guys don't necessarily run a pure nose off my, uh, off my memory, but Dion Walker doesn't really play like a traditional nose. So I think that that will actually lend to being a very unique mismatch in your defensive front. Pick number 21 for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, this is going to be edge rusher. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's a lot of great options here. And um, I think you can't say no to Michael Williams just because of the proximity. But LT Overton is a stud. I don't think you can go wrong 
Uh, I will go Michael here just because he's going to be a little bit more athletically inclined with probably some longer arms. You can't really make an argument about either one. Both are fantastic players. Mikel's had a worse year, but he also has a bit more untapped upside in the system that I think doesn't let their edges shine nearly as much at the moment based on recent history that Alabama does. I pick number 22 for the Arizona Cardinals. I think edge rusher defense interior, the ways to rock. You guys know the drill. And um, I think this is probably the route where I actually just go LT Overton. Like, I don't really think that I could have, ooh, Cayman Rucker would be nice because he also stands up and is a linebacker as well. I think he actually would fit a Gannon system far better than anyone else. Um, so this is going to be a surprise, but Cayman Rucker is going to be going over LT Overton. I pick number 23 for the Los Angeles Chargers. We will be looking at tight end here. Just based on the uh, lack of quantity of them in the class, I'm going to go after Colson Loveland just because, yeah, it's the cute pick. I mean, he goes back with Harbaugh, but... Also, the, you know, Harbaugh loves his tight ends, and this is a big reason why. Uh, That's a big reason why he ended up being so successful. Is like you got the Vernon Davises of the world that ended up really pushing him towards his success, and Colson Loveland did that for him at Michigan. He could do it for him again in the NFL. At 24 for the Broncos, I traded back to go after Josh Connerly, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that Tyler Warren is just the perfect pick for Denver. I mean, I think that you could go even higher than this technically. And technically, if Colson Loveland were on the board, I might consider it a little bit more to go after Connerly. But Tyler Warren is a super stud. He should be tight end one in the class, but it really just depends on what flavor of tight end that you are looking for. And number 25 for the Washington Commanders. This is an easy one for me. It's LT Overton all day. Fantastic edge rusher there out of Alabama, formerly Texas A&M. At 26, we have the Baltimore Ravens and... This is a team that I personally think we could see a little bit of love going towards the offensive tackle route. And um, the offensive tackle in question would be Josh Connerly. You could go Jack Nelson here if you cannot end up like having any faith in Josh Connerly to be a, an offensive tackle. His high-end reps are just absolutely bonkers, though. Josh Connerly has just some of the most lockdown reps that I have seen personally. And I do think a team like the Steelers would not legitimately consider Josh Connerly if he slips to that spot. So we are going to go after him. At pick 27 for the Pittsburgh Steelers, we got some great receivers on the board. And Pittsburgh, you can't really say no to a great receiver. However, in this situation, I might be willing to. It sounds batshit crazy because, like, hey, we need a true number two receiver. Mike Williams probably not going to be brought back. And, you know, we kind of overpaid for him. But... I mean, looking at the receivers available, why not use that as potential trade bait? I don't really see any option outside of Drew Alar here that I would consider. And I mean, there's teams that are desperate for some extra wide receiver talent. And I'm talking about, like, you can talk about the Browns here 100%. I think the Browns should be a team that looks also for that offensive tackle route. And Loki would not mind moving up with them for an offensive tackle here at 27. I'm looking at a couple teams in here that will be looking for offensive line talent, but I don't see it being worth it for them. Uh, I mean, there's just not many teams. The Saints, the Saints have the capital to move up, to be fair, to be able to get Luther Burden or Isaiah Bond. I do see them being within striking range. You can also talk about New York being in range as well. It's a tough position to be in. And like the more I look at it, the less I really like it. Um, I actually might want to do within the first round though. I'm on the Steelers. Uh, let's see. Let's look at the edges available. Woof. I mean, to be fair, I got a couple of them I like. I like JT Tweemel out a lot. And I know for a fact that the Eagles are a short a listed team uh, on the short list for an edge. I also know the Bills. Like, I know JT Tweemel is going to one of those two teams. So I might want to curve that with the Lions, who you already spent a good amount of draft capital. Not like a lot, but a noticeable amount to be able to move and get Zadaria Smith. I think this is going to be an easy, easy pick that, you know, the Steelers end up getting an extra fourth round pick out of this. I think that's very nice. It's just, it's a simple transaction that the Lions have the capability for, they need to do. And the Steelers aren't going to lose any value out of this. So the Lions move up to select JT Tuimolau. It's a, it's a massive need and it's great value. At 28 for the Minnesota Vikings, this is another team that needs to move the heck out of here. A lot of receivers are falling. That's just the way this thing rolls. Uh, but I mean, trying to find a valued player that is like a team will be desperate to move up for, not necessarily seeing it. And I might just want to go with the player who fits this team the best, who would give Brian Flores 
the biggest smile on his face. And I know right guard needs some help. Tyler Booker would be a great addition there. But I also know this class has a lot of really good tweeners. So I don't really feel the, the need to push pedal to the metal. I will be going after corner again. Ben Morrison is going to be uh, designated for return in this mock draft. And I will end up actually going, where did they end up putting Hancock? Oh, man, that was like my favorite guy to be able to use as a as a placeholder. They finally put him as a safety. They probably did. Did they just take? Oh, they did. They put him as a safety. We're going to use that as the placeholder. Jordan Hancock. Um, it is going to be my number 18 player on my board. Davison Igbenosin. Uh, he's a fantastic corner out of Ohio State. Again, it's not Jordan Hancock. It is cornerback Davison Igbenosin, my number 18 player. Physical, big boundary guy. He's been my favorite pick for the Vikings so far this year. At 29 for the Philadelphia Eagles, I think it's tight end or edge rusher. I really love Harold Fannin. I do think that he could be a dark horse pick, sleep, uh, sleeper into the first, just because he's a little undersized, but he still blocks very well, I think. Again, Cam Williams designated for return in this as well. Would have went to the 49ers if not. Um, Philly should be on the move out of here. If I'm just going to be real right now, like edge rusher, I do like Kyle Kennard a lot. I do like Prinsley Uman Mielin a lot, but I don't really feel that this team is absolutely hard pressed to be going after an edge at this spot. I know that they need it, but at the same time, I'm looking at the value. The guy who I'd be considering the most is Princely. And Princely does have some coverage ability. Princely's had a fantastic year, and I hope he ends up getting that initial get off to be improved. I don't necessarily believe in him as a pure first round pick, but based on the overall um, thought process that goes into this draft and what people have said, evaluators look at it. These guys aren't even looked at as first round picks at this point. There's like 10 dudes that people think are first. So now you can actually justify a pick like Princely Uman Mielin here at pick 29. At pick number 30 for the Buffalo Bills, um, edge rusher would have been nice. But I also do think at this point, when you have great receiving talent like this, you can't really say no. And um, Isaiah Bond's here. I don't think you could pass up on him. Luther Burden would be interesting, but I think Isaiah Bond will take over for where Amari Cooper is right now. So that's going to be a great selection there. And at 31, we have the Steelers. Uh, again, we could actually go after Luther Burden here and just say we're going after best player available. Emeka Buka has been kind of a slot merchant as of the past two years. And his best year technically was where he was a boundary receiver, in my opinion, where JSN was in the slot and, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. was Marvin Harrison Jr. But something I do want to say, Emeka has, I don't know if Emeka has been the second best receiver on his team. And I, I don't know, like, has he? You Like, he's never been better than Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Like, he, like, let's just be honest, he's not. He wasn't better than Chris Olave, wasn't better than JSN, like... He's never been the best. Has he been the second best? I'm not sure. Um, you know, Carnell Tate as well as Jeremiah Smith, I think are better arguably than Emeka Abuka. So I'm not trying to trash Emeka here, but I'm saying that there might be less reason to really be trusting of him in the first round where he's going to need to take a much larger role for Pittsburgh. And this is a team that has done a phenomenal job sniping talent down the board. And this is going to piss so many people off. I already know it, but... I'm just going to go after it. I think Drew Alar returns to school. If I'm just going to like throw a Hail Mary out there, I think people aren't respecting him enough. And I watched that game versus Ohio State. He was not the problem. And actually, his last throw was a drop touchdown, which was a beautiful throw. I know that we have two quarterbacks that are on one-year contracts. I highly doubt that both of them will be on for much more than one more year. And um, so I'm going to go after him. I know it's going to piss people off, but that fifth-year contract for someone who's 20 years old, has a cannon of an arm, is very Big Ben-esque. He's AFC North. Like, he is the AFC North. I think it will be worth it. Pick number 32 for the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm looking at Luther Burden here, and it's like, wolf, can we, like, find a way for him to work for Kansas City? Because it's hard to believe that he would slip out of the first, and I'm trying my best to find teams that would be very interested in him. Technically, we could just do a trade with a team that just traded out of um, their first first-round pick with the Titans, where they could just totally revamp the receiving core, Tetro McMillan and Luther Burden. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Honestly, based on the options available, we could also move up with the Browns to where they end up like totally revamping as well. But I also do think that the Browns would not be necessarily in a position where they need to go after Luther. I don't see that as a massive need. Um, but I mean, looking at it, I'm not seeing a ton of teams. The Cowboys, the Cowboys could be in a good position here, though. They have two second round picks and 
I think that they certainly could be in a good position based on what they did in the first to go after after Luther here. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to pull that trigger. Let's not do that. I will actually pull the trigger, though, and just go freaking crazy with the Titans. I think they have the perfect amount. I think that you have pick 104 here. And technically, I'm actually going to do this. We're going to go 69, and then we're going to go 96 there. Um, I think that being able to essentially just move up and then move back, you can end up potentially tossing in like 167 here and then 217 to make it a little bit more Tennessee-esque. But I mean, if it, feel free to do that calculation on your own. But regardless, um, I think the Tennessee Titans need to get aggressive. They moved back in the first, it's like Tetro McMillan, but Luther Burton is perfect for Brian Callahan's system. This is going to be your Tyler Boyd of the future. I know it's kind of crazy to just go back to back top tier receivers, but when you have the option to completely revamp your receiving core, it's a position that will give you a lot, a lot of flexibility if you can pay them at this rate rather than the actual free agency rate. So that's going to be the video. Crazy first round, but I love you guys. Stay tuned for rounds two and three tomorrow. See you on the far side.